So hello, today I'm at St Mary the Virgin's Church in Malden in Essex and I'd like to talk to you about the history of the town and the church itself. So Malden is a town in Essex, it's located next to the river, the Blackwater Estuary and from here the river Chelmer heads back to Chelmsford. Malden is 10 miles from Chelmsford and 4.5 miles from Danbury. The town is surrounded by farmland and villages and the elevation at its highest point is around 38 metres above sea level. The population is 15,000, so it's a fairly large town. The Malden's always been an important port, dating back to the Roman period of Emperor Claudius of 43 AD. It sits halfway between Colchester and Bradwell on sea, so it's making it an ideal location for trade. The Blackwater Estuary contains high salt content, which was extracted. Cooking the water produced salt flakes, which were highly prized and would have been exported across the Roman Empire. Now, it's likely that oysters also in abundance along the Blackwater Estuary would have been packed into salt loaded barrels and shipped back off to Rome. By the 5th century the East Saxons had fully utilised the town's port and high elevation for they called the place Maldon which means monument on the hill. Now today Hives Quayside which is in front of me was the artisan quarters of that time and archaeologists found imported pottery from the 7th century and they found it in the cemetery of St Mary's Church which is just there. They also found post holes from an earlier Saxon church. So remember around this time, the 7th century, St Sed established the chapel at Bradwell on Sea in 654 AD, further up the estuary. I just pan around, you can see. How the estuary Mirandas eventually, well, not far from here, to the North Sea. Now, the Vikings made their presence here in 924. Edward the Elder fortified Malden and he lived here. Malden and Essex were under Viking attack by the Danes. Edward was in fact the son of Alfred the Great. Malden was also the location of the Royal Mint in the time of King Ethelstan. So the Danes realised it would be easy pickings. It's easy to come off the North Sea and go straight up the estuary here and attack Malden. So there's only a couple, so first of all I would feel very now with flags of ravens flying, the, the Vikings made their way up the black water in 991 AD, led by Olaf Tryggvason. An estimated 4,000 men landed on the nearby Osi Island, which is behind me. Now Earl Britnoff and his Saxon army headed for Osi Island to cut them off. And, it's, and it had a stone causeway which is still there today, built by the Romans. And twice a day that causeway floods. And the Vikings amassed on this island, they wore the war amulets of Tor and Odin, hanging around their necks. They were desperate to storm the mainland. But Britain off he sent three of his bravest warriors to block the causeway. And so they did with axes and shields. But for some unknown reason, perhaps honour, Britnoff, he withdrew his men and allowed the battle to take hold on the mainland. So on a summer's day, on the 10th of August, 991 AD, Britnoff was slain and the Battle of Malden was forged in English history. The Danes, they carried off Britnoff's head as a trophy 
and they were paid off in silver, over three tonnes in silver coins, and they were loaded onto the long ships of Trigvesson. And I would say that those very ships would have loaded here, where we're looking now. Now, four years later, Tryggvason would become King of Norway and become Saint Olaf, as he is known today in Scandinavia. And it's most likely that it was Malden Silver that influenced this in some way. Britnoff today, the Saxon warrior, is a symbol here and a hero to the people of this town. And a fine statue stands at All Saints Church. And the promenade walk, five minutes walk from here. And if you walk down, if I zoom up, on the end there, we have a fine bronze statue of Brintov. It's a highly recommended walk. Now we move forward to 1066 and the Normans. Just before the Normans invaded, we had two freemen who were lords here, but by 1086, the Normans had divided this town into seven manors. William the Conqueror himself owned three of the manors here and the rest was divided between Count Eustace of Boulogne and Swine of Essex and Ranulf Peveril, incredibly powerful characters. Now Malden was a very big settlement as settlements go in the Norman period. We had 54 households, 8 slaves and 8 plough teams and 140 cattle 180 pigs and 500 sheep and it would have been quite a sight now under Norman rule Malden still retained its royal mint and it would also supply interestingly a war horse and warships as required for the king and this would have been King William of Normandy Now, in 1171, Henry II awarded a royal charter to this town and the horse and the ship arrangement carried on. Now, by 1189, Richard the Lionheart, the Crusader King, he would grant a further charter here. Malden would go on to receive a total of 14 royal charters and they're on display at the town hall known as Moat Hall, which is still open and you can visit. We also have a Beely Abbey. It still exists. It's set close to the River Chelmer, not far from Malden, going towards Chelmsford. Now, Robert de Mantel was Lord of Malden and Sheriff of Essex, and he founded this abbey in 1180. Of this period, leprosy was a major disease in the 12th century and there was no known cure. And St Giles the Leper Hospital was founded in 1164, not far from here, by King Henry II. Essex had 10 such hospitals, but St Giles is the only ruin to exist from this time. It's worth a visit and it's open to the public. Now, Malden really took off during the 14th and 15th centuries. In 1365, the Hive Quay, which is in front of us, had its own crane. 
and it unloaded mussels and oysters and such goods and wool would have given the town great wealth even in 1339 we had Italian cargo ships would have been loaded with wool bales and soon the goods would leave for Calais in France and salt would go to Zealand which is today's Netherlands so it was a truly international port Now in the 1372 survey, Malden had 19 mariners registered here. The port and the quay would have been a hive of activity and shipbuilding. Now the Hundred Years War of Henry V saw many orders for ships coming in from the Navy and Malden itself had built nine ships and the mariners on the records had grown to 143. Now Sir Robert Darcy would become MP for Malden during this time and he began his career as a lawyer and he was even representing the town against the Bishop of London. After he won the case he became a hero and Moot Hall was given to the citizens of this town. Darcy then became a Crown lawyer and he obtained licences for Malden to ship grain to the Netherlands. Now Moot Hall is still in the high street as I said before and if you go next to it there's a sports shop and a small window, a glass window and it shows the left, the, what's left of Sir Darcy's grand house, just a brick wall. Now Malden interestingly would have a market on a Wednesday and a Saturday during the 14th century and some merchants avoiding the harbour taxes would unload at nearby Haybridge. Eventually this would give Haybridge its independence and Haybridge is simply in the distance there. Now the 1554 Royal Charter allowed the town to hold three annual fairs and they would each be four days long. So quite a long fair indeed. Now the town, the town at one, at one time, can't speak, at one time had three churches. We had All Saints to the west, St Peter's in the centre and of course St Mary's to the east. 
uh, above Hive Key. So St Peter's in the centre is now a library. Which brings us on to that. So we had a Mr Plume, a Dr Plume of 1630. He was to become a vicar of Greenwich, London for 46 years. And Plume was born and baptised here. And in his life he collected 8,000 books. And in 1704, in his last will and testament, he, do he donated his entire collection to the Plume Library, which is at St Peter's now. Now, if you're from America, and perhaps interested in America's first president, George Washington, well, the great-great-grandfather Lawrence was Lawrence Washington and he's buried at All Saints Church, which, you can, which is in the centre of town. Now, St Lawrence was actually a rector in nearby Purley for 12 years. And also, in Malden in Massachusetts, America, it was in part founded by two pilgrims from here in the 17th century. Now perhaps the most interesting character, one of the characters from Malden would be Edward Bright of 1721. He was known as the Fat Man of Malden. Now Edward lived in the High Street and he was known to be a very honest tradesman and a tender father and a valuable friend. Now he weighed in at a colossal 302 kilograms. Or if we put that in old money it's 47 and a half stone. Now after his death, there was a wager that took place in the Black Bull Inn and seven local men, they climbed inside Edward's waistcoat. And a, sc a sculpture of this hangs not far from the King's Head today. Now Essex's coastline is perfectly, or was perfectly adapted to the free trade, or it was called smuggling. This was in the 18th and 19th centuries, so not so long ago. The death penalty was introduced in 1746, but it deterred very few from this trade. You could earn, or a smuggler could earn, seven times that of a regular person working on the fields or on a ship. And they would smuggle such things as tea or brandy or silk. In fact, anything they could get their hands on. Now for the customs men of old customs house here, it was a big problem. In fact, all the ports and towns around the coast of Essex were involved, from Pagglesham to Leonsea to Corringham. And many church towers were in fact used to warn the smugglers by the families. Some were even used to hide the contraband. Now today, Malden is famous for its Thames barges, Thames sailing barges. And we're going to walk past some now. Now these are special in that they're flat bottomed and they're perfectly designed for the Blackwater and the Thames estuary. They can carry up to 100 tonnes, even now. And they would transport anything and everything from bricks to grain. Now, Malden's dockyards have been building such boats for hundreds of years. <coughs> and Cook's Yard which we've got a sign over here, still work on boats and ship writing.
Now today these fine old barges are used for pleasure. Some even making fine homes. I mean this one, tea room, yeah, it's fantastic. Many of the Thames barges in front of us now, these are used for sailing trips. So we should have a closer look. And these guys have been working on a sail, painting it. Now I've got fond memories of Malden and the black water. So my father had a clinker built sailing boat, fairly small. Um, and OC Island I've got a connection with because he um, he had he sank it an accident he left the keel down and when the tide went out the keel went through the the floor and we had to evacuate and that was the end of it but for years we used to come here it's a great place now going back to Cook's Yard which is here they built whaler-sized boats for the Admiralty during World War Two. And they would launch one every three weeks during those long years. It gives you an idea. All right, let's go here. We should go forward and see these guys painting the cell. You see it goes into the history of these old sailing barges. Gives you an idea of the size of the sail. There's another part of history here, fairly modern, is that Malden would be home of Tesco, the first supermarket here in 1958, and now they're everywhere. And still today, Malden produces the famous sea salt, which goes back to the time of was a time before the Romans, so the Iron Age. Now also a famous thing that Malden is famous for is the Malden Mud Race. This is a race that's done for charity and in the distance there that's where the race takes place. It's twice a year and trust me, I've tried it in winter, it's only 400 metres long. But run or wade or crawl through the mud and you will find out soon enough why it's called Blackwater Estuary. They also have an event here called Taxi Day. Another great idea. Each year the, the, the black cabs from London or the cabbies, they drive down here. On board they take disabled children so they can visit the seaside. And this has been going on since 1952. We should make our way to the actual church. Morning. Morning. How are you doing? 
Sorry? Nothing. Nothing? Sounds very technical. When we're talking pubs, there's two right here. A pub there and a pub there. Queen's head there. So Malden is quite frankly sport for choice. If you go up into the high street, which is in that direction, you'll see what I mean. You've got Carpenter's Arms, the Blue Boar, which is 14th century. You've got the White Horse, the Rose and Crown, the Jolly Sailor, the Swan, the Queen's Head, and on and on and on. It's a fantastic place if you're into pubs, restaurants. And you can see there, there's various paths, walking paths. So from here, if you follow where those people are going, it takes it up to the... Paul Butterworth, Billy Ricky. They're not fancy by any standards. No, I love history. Oh, yeah, I like mine then. God, I love I'll history. waffle on all day long. Do you know the kids are from the death of Melbourne Burden in uh, history? No. You want to get in touch with him? He's, he's brilliant. I'll look him up. Look him up. Is he, he on there? In Melbourne and Burnham. I can't think of his name. No, but he's the wrong guys in the wrong place around here. Mate of mine, mate of mine, uh, Jonathan, he's 76. Yeah. He's, a, he's an architect. He goes to St Mary's. Mm -hmm. They say that St Mary's is 900 years old, right? He says it's 1200 years old. And he's got proof. Well, it's got Saxon uh, yeah. church there before, hasn't it? So underneath, you got the post holes. It's amazing. Yeah, this is a really old place. That's probably where it gets the name from, it's, it's the church itself. Yeah. And these buildings, this one as well. You know, the, the very top of it, the, yeah. the, high, the room at the top. Yeah. It was the ship owners, because this was right proper busy. Yeah. The ship owners used to sit out there, keeping an eye on their boats, making sure that people were working. Oh, like, oh right, Keep making sure. Yeah. Yeah, we got like, we got something similar in my town, where the owner of the land, you built a, a glass roof top on it, so yeah. you could watch everybody. Yeah. So you reckon that's up there for that reason? Yeah, 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 definitely. There you go, local history. Anyway, have a good day, yeah? And you may tell you what, there's a sign up and down, it's in the wrong place. I was... <laughs> you know, uh, what is it, uh, Lion Shakes? Yeah. Well, that uh, says up there, on the Dolphin Cut, it's in the wrong place. They all make mistakes. Yeah, I know. It should be uh, three alleyways down. <laughs> 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 there's no way through, so. <laughs> See you later. Really? Very friendly locals here, giving me some information. That's the thing, you can find out a lot more from locals. So now we're walking up to St Mary's perimeter. So we're on the north side. Let's turn around here. And that gentleman is saying that the top of that building was built so the ship owners could keep an eye on their crews, make sure they're working, not skiving. Nothing much has changed. So you can see it's a quite an interesting wall. All put together with whatever's could be found in this old town.
I'm just going to get to the paperwork. So, St Mary the Virgin Church. Like that guy said, could be a lot older than it seems. But we do know that it's from the 12th century parts of it. So this is the West Tower on the north side. Now we should go around to the Now we're on the west side of the West Tower. So it's built in three stages. Actually, if we go around to the sunny side, we can see it better. So this West Tower is 17 and a half feet square. Oh, it's a better side. You can see everything here. Glorious. So it's built in two stages. The lower section here was built uh, in the 14th century and they reused 12th century stonework and I can show you some of that. And I believe that this would have been from the original archway. So if you look down here, the patterned stonework and there. And all the way across, you can see remnants of the past. It's most likely that these square blocks are from the original porch. Or at least part of the structure. And you can see the wall pattern there. So it's definitely Norman. And you can see where they've cut into the Victorian south file this is the south file here if we come back the upper part of this tower was built in 1623 and the original tower fell in 1605 If you can see there on the top, you've got an octagonal turret and shingled spire of 1740. And this was built in the year of the Great Frost. So it was more or less cold the whole year. Now I also found out that in this year, Royal Britannia was first performed to the Prince of Wales at his home. We just have a quick look at the doorway. So this is the original 14th century doorway. So this will be built in the time of the Peasants' Revolt, the Hundred Years' War, and there's so many things going on in that time, one of the busiest periods of history. Now we're gonna walk round to the south aisle. So in front of us you can see they put a new extension on and they use this for a lot of their meetings and it's a lot easier to keep warm and so it's quite ideal in the winter. Glorious sunny day now, it's 21 today and we've heard about three weeks of fair weather, very good weather with virtually no rain so it's good for public not so good for farmers but we'll take what we can get because the climate can change here so just to give you an idea where we are again so there's the Backwater estuary, and probably in line with that house beyond it, there would be Norvi Island and then Osi Island. So, 
So this is the South Isle here. This is Victorian. Now it's built by the architect Frederick Chancellor between 1885 and 1887. And he spent most of his career in Essex. He worked on 570 church-like buildings and he lived in Chelmsford. And one year after completing this, he became mayor of Chelmsford. His sons would go on to design as well. So it's a fairly modern part of the building. It gives you an idea of Victorian build quality. Look at that doorway, it's fantastic. Look at the great roof line of that building, the chimney, isn't that fantastic? So a lot of these buildings are listed, which means they're protected under law. So you can't alter the appearance of the outside without permission. So now we're on the north wall. This is the chant, this is the nave. So this is the 12th century side. And you can see from a distance the huge amount of work that's gone on. It's immense. Obviously being virtually by the side of the sea, the salt spray would come up and hit this building and you can see what it does to limestone. We'll squeeze through these two headstones here. Now in front of us is the North porch, you can see they block that up. And there would have been a window there. That's all right. Not your fault. Now, this is the oldest window in the church. You can see how they built this church. It's basically just flint off the fields. They dragged in from various other places. Now we're going to go into the old port. It's not as old as some, but it's 16th century. Sorry, it's 15th century, so it's, it's fairly old. It's quite unusual, because it's all stone. The original woodwork beams. And here, got a lovely statue of St. Peter the Fisherman. It's obviously a strong connection with the mariner side of this town. We've got some lovely flowers, which may be from a wedding or connected to Easter perhaps. And then you have the stone jams. You can see a really interesting pattern there from the old times. All carved out of stone and you can see the wear on that. How many people have brushed through here this particular part, you can see it's got a big part missing, maybe seven, eight hundred years of jangling big keys around and brushing past. Well, we've got a big pine door here, which is early 18th century. So it'd be around the time of Dick Turpin the smuggler. And we shall enter. So this is quite an unusual door that I found because it's pine. Most of the church doors are oak. Be 
big old clunk. I'm just going to put my duck sack off. Okay, I'm going to come right back here and my cap. So the nave itself is 66 feet by 24 feet, it's 12th century and it's built in 1130 in the time of Henry I. You've got some magnificent beams up there. Now it's a fairly sparse and uh, church as they go for its size. It's quite unusual. Now, this is St. George. St. George and this is a 1933 statue. We should go here. Look at this wonderful window. This is from 1920 by William Pierce and Ephraim Cutler of Birmingham. Now William was the glass uh, manufacturer and Ephraim was the designer. And it's a real work of art. Again, you can see they put a mariner in there. The detail, so Jesus is above, looks like a soldier's just lost his life. Got his hat there. Look at the detail. Great detail. I don't know if you can see that, but just about make that out. Pearson Cutler. And if you look them up, they're really quite good. The work they do. Now, this memorial. It's the First World War, and if you look at the base, we've got a young lad called Ben Kobe, and these are all the fallen soldiers from that great war. Now, Ben Kobe was from Malden, and he died, died at age 19, and he died in 1914, right before, I believe, from what I read, before the actual war started. I think he was a driver. His name was left off the memorial, and the reason was he was born out of wedlock. So his family campaigned for a long time and finally got the recognition he deserves. So in front of us, we've got a fine statue of Virgin Mary. It really is fantastic detail. This was installed in 1929, and then you've got the dedication lamp here. Got a little recess. You've got the original pine boards there, can you see? Now then, over here, this is the rude stairway, or access to it, and it will come out there. So the rude stairs were discovered during the major restoration of 1886. Originally it would have been a gallery, so you can imagine that a gallery would have spanned across to the other side. Now, if you look inside here, they found some medieval tiles. And they've reset them in the floor here. Some of them have got patterns on them. Now these tiles are from the 14th century and it's most likely they would have come from Danbury because Danbury 
which is just not far from here, was actually the centre of tile making. They even supplied King John, John's Hunting Lodge and Hadley Castle. If you look here, you've got the original 12th century arch, where it would begin from here. You can just see it would have been coming across. And if you follow it across the other side, you've got what's left of it there. Now, on the floor here, we've got a seriously old memorial. This is 1486. This is related to John Fenn, a merchant of Calais. And in this year, 1486, Henry II married Elizabeth of York, uniting the House of Lancaster and York, ending the Hundred Years' War. So that's seriously old. Probably written in Latin. Now we've got the chancel itself here. And this fine window in front is from 1912, so just two years before World War I. And it shows the crucifixion of Jesus and on his left, the Good Shepherd and Holy Communion, just like the Last Supper. This organ, I believe, is from, was donated in 1980 by the Masonic Lodge. It came originally from the St. Peter's Hospital. It's no longer in use. If you look at the organ there, we'll talk about that at the end. This beautiful pulpit here. Let me see if I can get a bit closer. This is Jacobean. Now this comes from um, Mashby's church in 1990. The church has now been turned into a house, it's private. So it was obviously the church's pulpit. Now this part of the building is the extension, the Victorian extension. This is the south aisle inside, if you can see that. And in front of us we have the altar of the Blessed Sacrament. They hold uh, weekday masses here and it was designed by Frederick Chancellor's son, Wickham. So you can see it's like built in a light oak. So it looks really good for considering it's around 1880. And we've got this window here. This window is quite modern in design. This is designed by Mark Agnes in 1991 to remember the Battle of Malden, 1,000 years centenary. And it portrays dying Britain off praying on the battlefield. So I guess that's the centre part. There's a prayer there. Goes with it. Now his work's really quite something, if you look at him up, he's uh, it's quite spectacular what he can do. Now what we've got in front is a revered dossier and a communion rail. Now these would originally have been in the front of this church. These are from the 18th century, these are early 18th century, these are oak. And you've got the square posts and you've got the twisted bolsters, I think they're called. So this would have been at the front. And originally these were set up from around the 16th century, I believe, to stop dogs going up on the altar and urinated. But these are obviously a lot newer. So they'd stop them going up onto the altar era. So here's the Rereados. This is 1914, so it's again First World War, very beginning. And um, this again is designed by Wickham Chancellor. It's painted in pre-Raphaelite style in memory of 
man called Edward Fitch, who was the mayor of Malden. You can see quite fine detail there. Like this to be real gold leaf on the things. And then it's got angels flanking the panels inside. And you can see lots of grape vines. The vines of life, I guess. You can see detail there. No cheating. And then you've got over here, you've got the visitor's book. So it's good to fill that in because that shows that somebody's been in here. It's quite interesting for people to see where you've come from as well. You've got postcards, etc. There's various, there's various floor slabs, which I've got no detail on. But if we go above, we've got a fairly recent gallery here. You can see that steel work. Um, that was set up by a company called Punch of Tolsbury. And that organ up there comes from Germany, actually. It's, um, I'll just have a look. It's a Zimbelstern, it's only 30 years old. And it's the only one in Essex, maybe on this side of the country. And what's interesting is the gallery there can hold a choir and it can have obviously a choir below. And one good thing with this church is quite open plan, so you can, they, uh, they have concerts in here. They have their own choir and uh, you can go on YouTube and see some of the music they make and they can also have the choir down the front there as well. So this is one of these churches that's open, so if you're always welcome to come in here. So today St Mary the Virgin Church um, carries out baptisms, weddings and funerals. And they do uh, bell ringing groups, or they've got bell ringing groups going, and they've also got their own choir. Just like to say, the church has got six bells, talking of bell ringing. Um, I only know that they've got a Miles Gray of 1636, and it was it was forged by Miles Gray the first. He was known as the Prince of Bellfounders, and his son and grandson all became Bellfounders, and they were all called Miles Gray. So I hope you enjoyed that, thank you very much.